Hawthorne is a well-nurtured small island where everything is run and controlled by chef. The Menu is a film about a bonkers chef who decides to go out in flames, really, and everything in the design, every idea, every item, every palette within that building, we want it to be created specifically to represent the vision of Chef Slowick, Ray Fine's character. And on that note, food. For him, food is like a religion. He is the master, so he watches the kitchen prepare the food that he's created or designed. When you walk into Hawthorne, you see that everything has been chosen for a reason. The attention to detail is unparalleled. It's interesting because it's an experience, and all of us, other than Margot, really, are there for the experience of it. Oh, food is theater. Food is comedy. Food is drama. Food is satire. The flavors are there. It's very clean. It's very, um, thalassic. Thalassic? Oceanic. The idea that you're pairing that experience with the structure of a film made perfect sense to me. That's fiendish. I didn't really know this world, so I needed people who did. Your eyes are on everything. Everything. I saw the chef's table about Dominique Crenn. was completely taken with her and her whole vibe and spirit, and then Mark said, oh, she's going to design the food. So I was very excited about that. Dominique Crenn is this extraordinary artist, literally one of the best chefs in the world. In fact, the first woman in America to win three Michelin stars. This is a part of making sure that everyone is on the same page. It was important to also get a sense of who you are as a chef, so his food tell a story of who he is. I think that Dominique Crenn did a brilliant job in designing the dishes. There's a certain kind of like aggression to them in certain senses, which I really like. We specifically wanted Chef Slowick's creations to be beautiful, but somewhat dead. So that enabled Dominique in, in creating the menu to not create a Dominique Crenn menu, but to create a Chef Slow menu to play the role. Eat! We recruited a team of people, all of whom had experience in kitchens, and we gave them roles according to their experience. In a well-run kitchen, everyone knows precisely their place, both in the hierarchy and the physical space, their, their station. Plating in five. Yes, Chef! I love you all. We love you too, Chef! The satirical element was obviously take that into an almost kind of militaristic zone, but we had to make sure that what they were doing at every moment throughout the film was authentic and actually correct. Whatever we were cooking on the stoves or the grill or anything was always what the next course was, so it really did look like you were planning the night. Bread. It is and has always been the food of the common man, and so tonight you get no bread. David Gelb, the creator of Chef's Table, did a weekend in Adam McKay's offices. And some of my favorite shots in the film came from that weekend. And I really felt as we dropped these shots in that the balance of the film was just fundamentally right at that point. It was a huge moment for me. We really wanted to treat it seriously. Even though the film is very funny, we wanted the food to be like deadly serious. And so we used all the tools that we use on a Chef's Table food beauty shoot to achieve that. Being a part of it was just a dream come true. It's exciting. Food connect people, and you can tell a story through it. We always cook with love, don't we? Yes, sir! Everyone knows love is the most important ingredient. Good evening. Welcome to Hawthorne. The Menu is a film about a high-end restaurant run by a high-end chef who has his own agenda. I'm Julian Slowick, and tonight it'll be our pleasure to feed you. As each course is produced, it gets a little weirder and darker until things get very dark indeed. Margot has been invited to the best restaurant in the world. There's a level of discomfort she has that keeps continuing to grow. It's official. Tonight will be madness. Expecting the menu of a lifetime only to discover that there's a much bigger plan at play. Please hold still. I got really lucky with the cast. We needed to walk this specific line of taking the humanity very seriously without going the other way and making it camp. Lady in five. Yes, sir! I love you all. We love you too, sir! Slowick is obviously quite a complex character. You shouldn't be here tonight. For him, food is like a religion. He's quite a disturbing figure. Listen. I said listen. That silence means I'm free. 
Margot is an enigma, and she's supposed to be. We're asking Anya to do so much with very little dialogue. Anya's ability to switch in and out of the warmth she can have in one moment, but the hatred and, and distrust and shock in that, and I mean, it's just like the raw emotion. Tyler, what the hell is going on? Tyler is also an obsessive, but he's the exact type of obsessive that Sloic hates. Tyler is going to demonstrate his culinary expertise. He's a fervent believer in everything Chef Sloic said. He worships him. We're all going to die tonight. Isn't that right? Elsa is the maitre d' or the restaurant captain. Elsa is Chef Slowick's number one disciple. I take care of the customers so that Chef can take care of the menu. Hong brought tremendous depth and a specificity to it. You will not replace me. I think Mark and my lot have created a great atmosphere of an ensemble, a company, all enjoying each other's work and appreciating each other. It's completely different type of horror. I hope people say that they've never seen anything like that before because I certainly haven't. And on that note, food. The first thing I wanted to ask you, well, what was it about this project that made you want to be a part of it? Just the tone, the tone of the script was quite unusual. It was a sort of weird combination of a kind of su su subtle, subtle social satire kind of horror element, quite, quite psychologically well observed, I thought. And I thought the part of Chef Slowick was complex, interesting. I mean, it was, it was it's quite an interesting interior life, interesting psychology to the character. Um, and, it, and, and it had a dark humor that appealed to me. So there's a combination of tones in it, which meant, and I didn't know what, and I, also there was something about one couldn't quite tell how it would turn out which I quite liked, you know, it wasn't, it was, it was something indefinable about it that drew me to it. Speaking of Slowik, you're right, he is a complex man. Uh, we don't really know what's going on there, but it is, but he's fascinating at the same time. Who is Julian Slowik in your eyes, Ray? Uh, he's, a, he's a man from quite a, a humble uh, background who sort of made himself into something else, but he's had a gift for cooking, uh, an instinct for food, I think from as a young boy, he's loved preparing food, loved the ritual of making food and sharing it for people in quite a quite a human, in, in, in an attractive hum, humanistic way. That, you know, the celebration of food is something that he recognizes is, is an important aspect of our life, even in the simplest meals. And then his talent has got him to this place of you know, fame and wealth and renown. And he's and he's it's, it's like power and, and influence can corrupt people, and somehow it's it's twisted his own sense of himself and he's and at some deep level he knows it um and so he's in rather a tra tragic as a lost soul really that's what he is to me he's a lost soul um with a suffering from a sort of <laughs> a supreme narcissistic disorder <laughs> thank you rave so much for making him multi-dimensional um because the the audience somewhat really understands this man, even though his, his behavior is quite shocking. Was that important for you to make sure he was multidimensional and, and yeah, to keep no, I that think kind the of audience, I think the audience ideally should at moments be sympathetic to him or understand his point of view. I don't expect the audience to celebrate the more violent uh, things he does, but I think they might understand the deep, the deep dissatisfaction, the sort of self-loathing at the heart of it. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I think he's in the, he, there is, he's, he's a great script. Um, and, uh, I think he, we get an insight into how he feels about uh, a service industry where you're serving people something of real quality that they don't really appreciate. You know, they, they, they feel that their appreciation is related only to the, the size of the check they're paying at the end. Hence that oh, the elderly rich couple who he says, name one meal that you've had here. And they can't name a single meal they've had. And I think that that's, that, that's, that's profoundly disappointing to him, that he's really believing he's offering something and that people don't really, they, they tick it off on their list of restaurants that they've been to. 
Um, but he himself is guilty too of, of creating that kind of venue. So he's in a he's in a sort of psychic double bind, you know. He's created the high-end restaurant for those people whom he despises. So in that sense, he's lost. He's lost, he's bought into fame, celebrity, extreme, um, high-end sort of status, cult, cult status. In, and deep down he knows it's not right. Um, but he's lost in it, and that's why he's 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 gone mad, really. And can you give us a little bit of the your insight of how um, you prepared the role, and how was it for you to have a chef of the caliber of Dominique Crenn there, you know, at hand, on board? Well, that was very. Um, uh, it, it was very. Um, I really respected Mark Mylod's desire, and celebrated Mark Mylod's instinct to have someone like that, to have a, a Michelin star chef being brought properly into the process and properly looking at our set and critiquing the set and offering suggestions. So Dominique, Michelin star chef from San Francisco, French born, extraordinary woman, um, lovely presence came to our set. She not only guided me in the sort of behavioral modes, if you like, um, the, the way how you would sort of conduct yourself in the kitchen if you are at that level um, where you're not actually cooking so much, you're tasting, you know, you have your sous chefs to actually prepare the food. Um, so you're kind of like a high priest of the kitchen. Um, but, you know, she, uh, I, I understood from her that in her kitchen, certainly there's no um, Hit Hitlerian screaming and shouting. There's you know, the control, the authority is 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 exuded, is manifested through calmness, and through you know a, a, a deeper connection with all the chefs working for you. And I think that worked with the cult, the cult that the chef. You know, I mean, there's one or two moments when I lose my temper, but very few. Most of the time, it's it's this calm, ordered kitchen, slightly military in a way. Um, I don't think that's Dominique's style. So, we, you know, I was having to learn from her things that were useful for me, but also to meld it into what, what Chef Slovak is. Um, but she was around, you know, as I, as I say, she was talking to all the people who were involved in the design of the kitchen and the, the way that we, they wanted, Mark was keen that, you know, the, anyone who had experience of restaurants would look at the kitchen often when people are in the background of scenes preparing, that they would believe that was a functioning kitchen. So she was there with one or two other chefs who were based in Seattle, where we were shooting. There was a, there was a team of chefs, and, and then and the days leading up to shooting, Dominique, as it were, was the queen of the, the chef, the chef realizing, the realizing of our, of our restaurant. She was there as the top, the top person to, cast her eye. I have to say she was incredibly collaborative and supportive and, and also interested in the filmmaking process. You know, she, she, she was interested to know where, you know, her world melded with our world you know, and what we had to create a drama. And so where, what is the sweet spot where the drama is satisfied, but the truth of a restaurant is also realized on the screen. And another fascinating character, um, is Margot, played by Anya Taylor-Joy, because she's the unexpected guest that kind of throws a wrench into Slovak's uh, perfect plans for the soiree. And then there's an interesting dynamic there between the two of them, right? Yeah, well, she's the outsider. She's the unexpected guest. I mean, without giving any spoilers, all the guests are known entities to Slovak. They've either been there before, or if they haven't, he's researched them thoroughly. So he knows exactly who's eating in his restaurant. And the last minute, um, one of the guests, uh, Nick Tyler, played brilliantly by Nick Holt, brilliant performance, brings um, a different girl than the one that the restaurant has expected, a different girlfriend or a, a seeming girlfriend, um, played by, called Margot, played by Anya Taylor-Joy. Because she's a late arrival, um, she's, the, she's an unknown to Slowy and actually proves to be um, a woman of real toughness and doesn't, doesn't buy in to the preciousness or the, the, the mystique of the chef. She, doesn't, she resists it. 
Um, and then oh, sorry. she resisted. No, go on. What are you going to say? No, no, no. My, my apologies. <laughs> no, no. Exactly. She resisted, but then in resisting it, sort of funnily enough, you know, you know that your antagonist is also the someone who sees you. So basically, she takes up an oppositional element to the chef. But in doing so, they sort of have a, an understanding that there's a quite an interesting dynamic that develops between them. And then the kitchen itself, the restaurant, is almost its own character. I thought that the attention to detail in that kitchen and in the whole menu um, that your character puts together is also quite extraordinary. Well, that's all to do with, with the thoroughness that Mark Mylod brings to it, that he really wanted the kitchen to, despite it being a fancy schmancy kitchen, the high end prices, it, it still had to be absolutely real and, and be, be utterly convincing as that kind of restaurant. And that the detail was that in the design and in the, all, all, the, all the heads of departments bringing their skills to bear under Mark's direction, realizing that you know, we've got to believe in this place. We've got to really believe in it in order for the, the story to, to take us inside, take, it, take, take us in. You've mentioned Mark several times, and before finishing our interview, I did want to, I mean, you've worked with some of the best filmmakers of recent times, uh, Ray. But um, what do you think Mark brought into this, and especially in getting that tone that you mentioned right? Well, Mark, uh, he's very, very, he's very instinctive, he's very clever. I mean, he understands, first of all, he has a great, I feel he's very empathetic to the acting process. He knows that given time and the number of takes and the right kind of direction and, and in a way nurturing the actors, you know, actors can expand and he likes in the end, the final takes on any given shot, he, he'll ask you to improvise and play around. Um, and I felt that he was watching and, and suggesting all different kinds of nuances to every single take. I'm watching very astutely as to as to what you know, giving very clear feedback to anything that I did or any of us did. Um, and I felt he had a good plan. He had a good overview. He sort of knew how he wanted to shoot it, and there was no time wasted. And I think that's another thing that makes actors, and all actors and crew, relax or feel confident is when they know that the shape of the shooting day has very clearly been thought through. Um, and and that that engenders that, that 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 sort of encourages a feeling of confidence and thereby relaxation and so that the inventiveness and the, I mean Mark encourages he wants all the actors to play so he because he knows there are outside the intelligent reading of any line or speech there's also other possibilities that can be useful to him and to his editor. Um, Just so to wrap I, it up, um, uh, Ray, you mentioned before that you one of the things that you liked about the film is you didn't really know exactly how it would end, what would happen. It constantly surprised me. This is a movie that constantly surprised me and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I was wondering now that you've finished it and you look back at the whole experience of being a part of it, what surprised you? What would you say you learned? I don't know, are you a better cook now? <laughs> um, what did I learn? Was, um, well, I tell you what, I, I, the tone of the film, I don't know quite what I imagined. It was a little, when I saw it um, just with me and, and, and an agent, um, I wasn't sure because um, it, I couldn't tell what its tone was. I, I, I didn't know where it was. And then when I saw it with an audience, I completely understood that Mark had found a sweet spot of, of a kind of satirical entertainment. And I, I, I yeah, I, I, mean, I think one of the questions everyone was asking is what kind of film is this? Because rather sadly, you know, dialogue about filmmaking is often about what's it like? The film you're going to make, what is, what is it like? Which is somehow a bit depressing because I think, why does it have to be like anything? Why are we always wanting to understand a film by a film it might be like? I don't understand. But I quite like this because it actually was genuinely puzzling to people. And... Um, I guess they, they, they put it together, they tested it. They, I think Mark and the producers wanted the film to connect. Possibly I thought it might've been a slightly more art housey film with um, bit, maybe a bit more kind of opaque tone. But this, this seems to 
find a satirical tone that brings people in, brings an audience in. But you have to see it with an audience. I think it's, I think, um, I think it really, when I saw it in Toronto, that audience response was fantastic. And I couldn't agree with you more, Rafe. And by the way, um, you're brilliant, absolutely brilliant in this. One of your Thank finest performances without any doubt. Thank you so much for putting up with me today and uh, just, you know, wishing you all the luck in the world. Thank you so much. Great talking to you. Is that gonna fit everyone? Yeah, easily, 12 customers total. How do they turn a profit? 12.50 a head, that's how. What are we eating, a Rolex? It's one of his classics. You have to try the mouthfeel of the mignonette. Please don't say mouthful. Tonight will be madness. Welcome. We'll endeavor to make your evening as pleasant as possible. Welcome to Hawthorne. Here we are family. Yes, we harvest, we ferment, we gel. We gel. We gel. He's not just a chef, he's a storyteller. The game is trying to guess what the overarching theme of the entire meal is going to be. You won't know till the end. Who are you? I am Margo. Why do you care? I have to know if you're with us or with them. This menu. The pictures, they're of us. This guest list. How do they get these? It's not good. This entire evening. Jesus Christ. This is just theater. It's stagecraft. We're leaving now. Has been painstakingly planned. This is real, isn't it? What the hell is going on? We now offer you a 45 second head start. <laughs> okay, 45 seconds starts now. This is what you're paying for. Get that out of my way. It's all part of the menu. It's okay. No, we're gonna die today. Yes, we are. Yeah. Happy birthday to you. You told him it was my birthday? Seemed funny about three hours ago. Thank <laughs> you.